So, as I mentioned earlier, John the Baptizer has been getting quite a bit of attention over the last week, hasn't he? Uh, and if you want to know why we call him John the Baptizer, you'll have to read last week's sermon. Um, but in last Sunday's sermon, I explored how he, in my view, has a subtly different understanding of who the Messiah was meant to be and how he should act. And then on Thursday, I explored the sceptical side of John's nature, uh, the way that he, do you remember, sent inquiries uh, via messengers to Jesus saying, are you the Messiah? You know, sceptically minded. And I was suggesting that that is a generally healthy thing, scepticism, for all religious people. If you want to read that sermon, you'll find it in various places all over the place. Now, just now, we lit our third Advent candle and we reminded ourselves in the prayer of lighting of John's pivotal role as a witness to the truth, the burning and shining light of Christ. Despite all this focus on John that the lectionary invites us to uh, delve into so richly, we must never forget that, of course, his primary role was to be the announcer of Christ, the messenger of Christ, the one who makes straight the pathways of the Lord. As John himself recognised uh, and, and was reported as saying in the Gospel according to John chapter 3, I must decrease so that he may increase. Which is a pretty good motto for any Christian, isn't it? I must decrease so that he may increase. John recognised in today's Gospel that he himself was not even worthy to untie the thongs of the sandals of the Messiah. I love that word, thongs. It's, it's, just, it's just a lovely word, isn't it? He's not worthy to untie the thongs of the sandals of the Messiah. And as John the Gospel writer stressed in this morning's reading, John the baptizer was not the light himself but rather he came to testify to the light. It was Jesus, the light of the world, that John points to. And it is Jesus who, a short while after his baptism by John, would then claim for himself the opening lines of Isaiah 61 that Naomi just read for us very beautifully, I have to say. Thank you very much. When Jesus stood up in the synagogue of his hometown of Nazareth and claimed some of those words of Isaiah's. Here are the words that Jesus claimed. You can read about this in Luke chapter 4 if you're following this from a Bible study point of view. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me, he has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Having read those words, according to Luke's account, Jesus put down the scroll and said to the congregation, today these words have been fulfilled in your midst. Jesus deliberately and purposefully declared his mission to be one of bringing good news, binding up, healing and proclaiming liberty. He proclaimed that this was the year of the Lord's favour, which is all very beautiful. What I'm interested in is what Jesus doesn't say. I find it fascinating, and you might want to just open that reading if you've got it on your sheets. You might just want to find the place where it says that uh, Jesus has come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Because look at what he, where he stops. I find it fascinating that he didn't read on to the next line, which says, And the day of vengeance of the Lord. <laughs> Jesus stops at God's favour and doesn't draw our attention 
to Isaiah's proclamation of the vengeance of the Lord. You see, there's a bit of a stream of consciousness that flows throughout the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, or the Hebrew Bible. And it's a theme of judgment and divine vengeance, constantly invoked by prophets and seers throughout the ages, no doubt in an attempt to scare humanity to behave itself from time to time. The very oldest stories of the Bible picture God frankly, sometimes, as a bit of a divine bogeyman who needs to enact some kind of punishment on humanity. For the sins of Adam and Eve, they are cast out of the Garden of Eden. For the sins of all humanity, God sends a flood to wipe out the earth. Pharaoh and his riders are cast into the sea for having stood in the path of divine will. Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed because the people failed to offer hospitality to God's angels. Time and time again, the Bible's writers reach for stories of vengeance, of wrath, pouring out from heaven. But Jesus refuses to align himself closely with that kind of thinking. And those kinds of stories. Now he doesn't for a moment deny the power of human sin or its ability to destroy all around it. But neither does he retreat very often into metaphors of divine retribution and vengeance as the solution. Instead Jesus talks of God's love for the world. Just two chapters later than this morning's gospel, Jesus says those words which we repeat at every Thursday Eucharist because they were first planted in the book of common prayer for us. God so, say it with me, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life life. The God who Jesus introduces us to in many respects, or at least unfolds for greater understanding to us, is the God who does not seek the destruction of his children. This is not the angry, vengeful God of former understanding. This is the God of love, of healing, of binding up of setting free. This is God who is our holy parent. God the loving Father. And that ultimately, my brothers and sisters, is the good news that we're called to announce this coming Christmas and every day of the year. When we announce peace on earth and goodwill to all people on whom his favour rests, we speak of a transforming and overwhelming love. A love that proclaims good news to the poor. A love which binds up the broken hearted and releases captives of all different kinds. And if I'm honest with you, I'm frankly tired of hearing religious voices claiming that every disaster which befalls humanity is some kind of punishment. AIDS is the classic example, and it was never a punishment from God, and nor is COVID-19. They are both self-inflicted wounds by an unwise humanity who released otherwise harmless animal viruses into the human population. The devastation of earthquakes and even tsunamis are not divine vengeance or divine wrath being visited on humanity, but the self-inflicted wounds of an unwise humanity who build shoddy houses and beach resorts in known earthquake zones. God doesn't wage war, and he never requires suicide bombers. 
God does not work through vengeance or retribution. These things are not the will of God and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. God rather offers wisdom, light and love. Through Jesus, he offers us life, abundant life, filled with wisdom, healing, sharing and liberty. It's life which goes on forever. All we have to do is look to the light and live in the light of the wisdom and the truth of Jesus Christ. Just as John the baptizer discovered that he must also do. Amen. Amen.